welcome to Lisa at the Edge. It's so good to finally have you on the show. That's very excited to be here. Thanks, Lisa. No worries. So um, the plan for today will be, as always, for you to share your story about how you got into tech and the evolution of that career, because it's an interesting one, and to where you are now, uh, focused heavily on uh, Azure training. We will talk a little bit about hybrid cloud probably in between. Um, we've got a good fruit analogy when, <laughs> when comparing different uh, cloud providers to talk about. Um, and then I want to hear a little bit about you becoming MVP because I think it was last year you became MVP. Yes. Yes. It was. Yes. And then we are both uh, members of Cloud Lunch and Learn. So it's only fair that we give them a little bit of a shout out and talk about that at the end. So um, how does that sound to you? Sounds perfect. Looking forward to it. Awesome. Let's get cracking. Um, so before we get started, um, I'll hand over you to, to introduce yourself. Let the people know who okay. you are. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so yeah, for those of you who don't know me through the social media circles and everything. My name is Dwayne Natwick. I'm a cloud training architect lead at Opsgility. We're a Microsoft learning partner. So we do a lot of micro, I'm Microsoft certified trainer and a regional lead for that program. And we have Microsoft certified trainers that provide uh, training for certifications as well as we, uh, we work on and run a lot of Microsoft's open hacks and uh, and training events, boot camps, and things of that nature. So, and I've been here for uh, going on about eight months now, uh, and uh, really enjoy waking up and spreading the word and spreading the knowledge. And have uh, you know, have accumulated over the last few years quite a few Azure certifications to be yes. able to train many of the classes. <laughs> yes. And I just want to take a moment actually just to point out that both me and Dwayne today are wearing our Star Wars t-shirts. Yes. So we've both got our Star Wars t-shirts. Awesome. Um sorry if you're just listening. Um but uh I have a lilac purple one bit of Darth Vader vibes back in the day and yeah, Dwayne is yeah, Dwayne is uh, rocking a bit of uh, Baby Yoda or Grogu, as is his name. Yes. Um, I actually just recently uh, watched all of The Mandalorian, so I hadn't watched any of it. And then me and my little brother watched it over Christmas, and it's amazing. Although I was sad to then learn I needed to wait till 2022 for the next one. Right. But I'm going to catch up on the Clone Wars and all the series on Disney Plus because I haven't done that. Anyway, right. yep. I, dig I digress, which is normally what I do. <laughs> um, so let's kick off then with how you got into tech, because when we caught up about this, you initially didn't want to get into tech. You didn't find tech through gaming or playing about with PCs or anything. Um, and in fact, I think you wanted to manage bands. Is that correct? Yeah, that was kind of my, my <laughs> ultimate. Since I, since I, didn't seem like we, my, my garage band was going to get signed. I felt some other way to get into music might be band management, but, uh, but yeah, that didn't pan out either. Uh, you don't have you know, a, I'd, you don't have a side band. No, not anymore. No. I, I think, I, I think we need to see you do some training videos where you bring out Captain Hyperscaler, the musician. Captain Hyperscaler. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> It's hard. It's hard. I, I'm not. I was more. We were more of an original band. I'm not one that knows a whole lot of cover songs, and I'm a mm. bass player, so it's not as exciting usually as a guitar player. But uh, <laughs> I do know how to play. I, I can play Jeremy by Pearl Jam on the on the bass guitar, but that's about that's about it. Maybe just <laughs> and maybe, and maybe break out on the guitar a little more than a feeling by Boston, which. <laughs> Okay, so but so you originally wanted to to manage bands. We're in a band. Uh, that dream, unfortunately, uh, was left in the past, and you you landed in IT. So uh, tell us a little bit about how that happened. Uh, well, um, I was uh, what what you might what we call sometimes a bell brat in uh, the U.S. Where uh, I wasn't the, aware of this term. <laughs> yeah, the tele the telephone system, uh, which you know was a monopoly back you know, up until, up until the early mid eighties, uh, that, you know, ran all of the telephone infrastructure in, uh, the United States. Uh, my dad worked for them, 
out of the army until you know for like 23 years and uh it all and then when the government broke apart the monopoly they all became their own little pieces of the pie and my dad uh moved uh, the family had to move to New Jersey closer to an AT&T office because he was a service manager. And uh, through that and a couple years of moving during middle school, during my formative teen years, uh, my dad got us back to Maryland uh, running, uh, running the Baltimore, D.C., Northern Virginia area of a, and starting up essentially a branch for a telecom uh, interconnect company in that was based out of New Jersey, and they uh, they installed telephone systems and ran telephone cable and uh, and all of those those type of things. And yeah, and my dad, uh, you know, needed labor, and <laughs> I was old enough to pull a work permit at thirteen, and so uh, so he put me to work in summer times when I could I could pull help uh, help huffing cable around and uh and pulling cable one of the <clears throat> couple of cool jobs that were probably the first ones i was ever on was the uh washington dc post office sorting facility which was really cool oh. and then uh, and also one of the nasa offices in the uh in the bottom in the washington area uh so oh wow <clears throat> that is cool but then yeah that just kind of snowballed i went to college and gave me more uh gave me more per hour than than working in fast food plus it was mm. you know the work was there when I got home yeah and yeah. then uh then eventually I couldn't get a job in business management or HR because I didn't have any experience when I got out of college so my dad hired me full time and yes yeah, so you did a so you did a um a degree in business management in HR so even then you weren't thinking about IT or technology IT was not was the furthest thing from my mind <laughs> Um, and it, it's funny, we spoke a little bit about this as well, about you mentioning that you needed like 20 years experience straight out of college. It seems like that is still quite a common ask for people um, to have all these years of experience, um, even for really like beginner um, roles. It's very strange to me that we've not got over this. Um, yeah, with some yeah some companies and some roles, it's just really strange. And I, I think because it was HR, you know, there's a lot of laws that you need to really yes. know and be around. You know, it's almost it's almost to a certain degree a, a legal job. Yeah, uh, very much so. Probably even now worse than it was 30 years ago when I got yes. out of college, is yeah. because of the litigious society that we live yes. in could be a pro yeah but but yeah it was it was ridiculous there was no entry-level jobs it was kind of a recession in the u.s at the time too so the job market wasn't the best either you know people were looking for the you know, i think the pool had more probably seasoned professionals in in it as well to yeah to allow that so yeah uh but yeah it was wasn't wasn't fun i had to work for my dad <laughs> so yes so when to work for your dad um, but then you managed to make it onto a management program there, right? Yeah. So we, uh, so there was a distributor, up and coming distributor that was really expanding at the time that we bought, we purchased our equipment from and our, uh, all of our supplies and, uh, and they were hiring, you know, young out of college people for opening new branches and becoming brand, you know, branch managers and things of that nature. And, had the opportunity they were expanding in Maryland and uh, he hired uh, he hired me on uh, the manager there and brought me on and within eight months I was moved to Michigan <laughs> to open a branch so uh, we used to we, we used to go to uh, to training events uh, me and my kind of cohorts uh, around the country and we would uh, we would call ourselves the gravy train because we were the ones growing the business. <laughs> nice. And then, so you moved to Michigan and that's where you stayed. Yeah. 1995. I moved to Michigan. I've been here ever since met my <laughs> wife within my future wife within a couple months of being nice. here. And we've been together ever since my, I just turned 50 last week. And my wife uh, reminded me that I have now celebrated half of my life's birthdays with her <laughs> oh that's 
lovely. That's such a nice story. Mm-hmm. I, I love that you got your, oh, I love that. That's so cute. Um, and happy belated birthday to you and your wife. Cause I think you had your birthdays around the same time, right? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Hers is two days after mine. So yes. yep. Busy week well, last week. That's good. So to everyone out there, there's still the chance for true love people. This is what I like these stories. They give us all, all, all a singleton's hope. Um, <laughs> Um, so you, how did you get from there? So actually, when we spoke about it, I really liked that that you that you have basically had a role in all different parts of the business, like sales, sales engineering, operations, project management, um, solution architect, become you know product management over your sort of career. And I really like that. That's kind of what I'd like to do within my career. I think over the years is experience lots of different areas. Um, potentially before I, or if I ever sort of pick one to, uh, mm-hmm. to, to get right into it. I think there's such value in that. You automatically have such a better understanding for the other teams that you're working with. Um, maybe a little bit more empathy for those teams that potentially sometimes get on our nerves. I'll, I'll not uh-huh. say who, which teams that might be. <laughs> um, and I think that's really important because to be honest, I think we can get so bogged down in our role and our team and what we're doing in any job. Um, and we sometimes forget the fact that um, individuals like ourselves are in other teams and other roles, just trying to do their job. And we do all kind of need to work better together. <laughs> right. Um, but so yeah, talk, talk to us a little bit about those roles that you experienced and, and maybe give us your, uh, the one that you liked the most and maybe the one that you disliked. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, yeah. So well, obviously I started pulling cable. So I, you know, pulling both telephone cable and then pulling coax and twin X cable for, uh, for uh, AS 400 and, and token ring type systems. Uh, and then when I moved to the distributor company as a, as a manager, I was hiring people right out of college and I had to train them both for uh, understanding sales and working with customers uh because we did sales we were an all uh, a self-contained branch so we did sales we did shipping we did operations we did wow. inventory so we ran it was essentially a store that we ran yeah uh and uh which and then also i had to use my expertise of hands of my hands on to help train these kids just graduating college and you know, I was still in my twenties anyway, so I don't know if they're really kids. They were more peers of mine, <laughs> but, uh, but right out of college, I had no idea that, that the phone that was on my desk that, that they picked up and talked on had some s- level of back end to it and something yeah. behind the scenes. So I had yeah. to teach them all that. And, uh, from scratch really day one, which I really enjoy. I, I mean, I think that was really where my love for teaching started coming yeah. because I, you know, talking at that, uh, at that base level of things and, mm-hmm. and understanding that, uh, understanding where people, you know, different people comprehended things really yeah. became, you know, really became important to me. Um, after, after I, the opportunity to move out of that distribution, uh, I kind of hit, hit a ceiling there. They wanted me to leave Michigan and open up other branches. And at that point I was, uh, I was married uh, and didn't want to do that. And I had an opportunity then to become a manufacturer rep, which again, still I'm going around to distributors and to partners and all of that and teaching them about my product and teaching them how it was a connectivity uh, part, a connectivity company. So I was teaching them how to uh, punch cable on patch panels and, 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 uh. and and put fiber connectors on and things of that yes. nature. So I was very hands-on, but it was, it was a sales position that had quota attached to it, which, mm-hmm. uh, which you wanted to know what my least favorite thing was, is having a quota over my head yeah. and, uh, and being, you know, regardless of how, uh, you know, how good I am at my job, my, my quota is the, is the, Deter- was the determining factor of whether I was successful or not. And that's, yeah. just, that's always, um, I mean, I think I've mentioned this on every podcast, but um, ever since I sort of stepped into technology, people have said, you should be in sales. And, 
you know what? There's nothing more that I love than actually talking to a customer and helping them solve their problem. Um, but I think we both kind of shared this. Like when I say talking to them, I mean, listening to them, mm -hmm. really yep. understanding where they're coming from and what they're trying to achieve and helping them get there. And I, I'm not sure that I would like, like you say, the quota or the pressure to be selling a certain solution or yep. product. I mean, obviously I am very focused in my role at Dell because I'm focused on Azure Stack, whereas, you know, Dell does have a massive portfolio. I think mm -hmm. that's the great thing about like, like Dell, they have a massive portfolio. So really, you know, the way it should work is no matter what your solution, your problem is, we've got something that will probably help you. Um, but obviously I'm quite specific within Azure Stack, but then at the same time, I'm specific and I'm very clear on the customers we're looking for. So, you know, it's customers that are looking for, um, that have an Azure strategy, that have a Microsoft right. persona that might have Hyper-V in their, their data centers already. So it's not as if I'm uh, going out and saying, you know, we're trying to change, let's say VMware customers to Hyper-V, et cetera. Um, and I think, yes, yeah, this the sales part of all that, um, I just don't know how I'd feel about it. That said, there are many different types of roles in sales. I'm learning this as well at Dell because the, the sales org is so freaking huge. There right. are so many different teams um, and so many different layers to it. But I think I'm with you on the sales. I'm just not sure that it's a role that I could do. Yeah, the peer, it's the peer sales executive. So, you know, I've held like, you know, like sales engineer, sales, you know, solution architect type positions. And th those are fun because you're helping you know, you're, you're more of a support role on top of the sales executive that has the quota that, that, mm. you know, I enjoyed that position. Uh, but really, as I uh, evolved through my career and doing different project, you know, as project manager, engineers, and those, you know, those kind of roles, uh, you know, I found myself in a product manager role, which I really enjoyed. And I was that for the last five or five or six years before, I jumped to the training and probably that was probably my favorite role until eight months ago when I found that I could, I could do training full time and be involved in just teaching, uh, as a, as a career and, and get to the, and get to that point in my life, because that was always the part that I enjoyed, you know, in product management, even when we were doing a rollout, doing the training videos and training, uh, training WebExes, uh, because we were using Cisco WebEx at the time. So I use WebEx instead of, <laughs> instead of Teams. Um, we would, you know, I would enjoy doing that. And I, I felt comfortable in that area. Uh, and always, it's always been, you know, the one thing about the product manager role was it was always taking what I knew and sharing that knowledge, which, which was always something that gave me, uh, gave me passion to what I was doing. And, you know, at the end of the day. Yeah, I um, I would say that I really enjoyed my time in product management. I think when you say product management as well, it can be like I've learned that it's it's quite a different thing at Dell. Well, it is and it isn't. Um, but in in my experience working in for smaller companies, um, it was a bit more of everything. So yeah, there was that, especially, and I think we both shared a little bit of this experience, taking the more traditional MSPs, service provider types, and then um, helping them take those services that they offer on infrastructure that lives within their data center, but elevate that to offering managed services on a public cloud platform. Right. Um, and yeah, a lot of that was, um, you know, doing training with sales um, and everyone about the difference between like virtualization and cloud. And um, I loved that. I loved um, even just getting down to the, the detail of our service descriptions and what wording to use and how do we you know, toe the line between there'll be a little bit marketing, but clearly describing what the customer is going to get and, and what they can expect from the service. Um, and then, yeah, all this, the, the cogs and bolts that go into that. I really, I enjoyed my time doing that. Um, I like, I like a role with variety. So it definitely, um, yep. plays into that. Yeah. There's definitely variety there, especially depending on, you know, depending on whether there's a, uh, a separation of duties of product management and product marketing. Mm. You know, I've always been, you know, been involved a little bit in both aspects of it. Um, mm -hmm. Just probably from my sales background, yep. you know, I have the ability to put the marketing spin on it, but I'm not 
the marketing person that makes every you know makes everything exciting you know yes. the, the so marketing was, magic on it but yeah <laughs> I was very much quite often in the translator role so I would translate from tech and the service to uh-huh. marketing in terms of features benefits or really the value that the customer was getting yep. um, and then help them come up with the magic in the and yeah. the, the, well, the and then, well that's that's really where my technical knowledge came from in getting cloud certified and everything like that was so that I could take that conversation to that engineering and operations level and yeah. have that conversation around what their struggles were and what you know what they could accomplish and things like that like you said an MSP that's moving from hosting in their own cloud to supporting hosting within Azure or AWS uh, is uh, is two completely different things. Like you said, two completely different fruits <laughs> to, uh, to try and get there. And the change management of it all is really the biggest, the biggest challenge because you get the, you have the people with that data center mindset that, you know, that maybe they were hosting for customers, but they're still managing their own data center. Mm. So they get, they have, a different, uh, different perspective on things than than if we were managing things within a cloud. Yeah, so. and um, I like what you said there about. Um, so that's kind of why you went down the certification road because we discussed this as well. That um, I think we both like to f- understand what we're talking about, and I think that's why I've gone probably more technical than people in my role or even my previous roles would have really needed to go Mm -hmm. or would have traditionally gone because I do not like to talk about something if I don't think I understand it to a good enough level to talk about Mm it. Um, And I suppose all, I mean, where I am now, I'm always in this, like, how much should I know? And it really does fluctuate quite a lot. So I, I always think I don't know enough. But I lost and go into conversations and I know like more than enough to handle the conversations. Mm -hmm. And, but because I kind of sit between very technical people and non-technical people, I'm always kind of like, where am I sitting? But I definitely feel that I would not be comfortable or confident winging it with someone or a customer if I didn't understand what I'm talking about. It's important for me to, to have that depth of knowledge. And I think it really helps as well. And those conversations um mm-hmm. so is that where your certification your addiction to taking certifications uh, kicked off <laughs> it's an addiction that's probably a good a good phrase somebody for warned it. me I, like somebody I, warned me they said when you take the az 900 i think it was kenny actually he said it's a slippery slope they get addicted it is it, uh, well and uh, i have a certain level of ocd in my in my personality and i've really? always been really really kind of like a collector of you know it was like when i was younger it was baseball cards or you know i still have my star wars figures from the original the original series of star wars figures yeah. I, you know i have all of those uh when it was music it was cassettes and cds and and then mp3s i would just collect everything you know and so you can't have any missing that. or out of sync that, so if there's a but, cds then you can't have yeah. anything oh, yeah. Any yeah. missing. Exactly. And that, you know, that's exactly it. You know, I, uh, I just took my, uh, finished my data engineer associate this on Monday. Uh, I was sitting out and what drove me crazy was I passed the first exam in November of 2019. So for almost a year and a half, it like sat there, not complete and just didn't work for me. <laughs> <laughs> it just made me uncomfortable. I had to finish. I had to finish that exam. So, uh, so it, it is. It's it's a, a slippery slope. You know, I had when I was in infrastructure cable. I had my my certifications from Bixi uh, for that. Then I uh, got uh, my master's degree in business IT, which uh, had the uh, had two tracks. One was the uh, product man- uh, project management professional. The other was the ISC2 CISSP for information security. I went down the project management track just because of where I was at at the time. Mm. But but three years later, I got my CISSP. So I've finished essentially the certifications for both those tracks. And then, yes, then it was, you know, we started down AWS with the company I was with uh, 
couple companies ago and got my cloud practitioner there, but then we moved, we shifted it to Microsoft and I then started all my Azure certifications and, and here then, we are yeah. about two, two years later and I have 14 of them. <laughs> wow, wow. Um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see, first of all, if I pass the EZ900. Um, oh, I'm sure you will. <laughs> and then, do you know what the funny thing is as well, is that, um, so I've been meaning to do it for ages and I've just put it off and off because I've been so busy with work. But um, right now, it's it's actually really great. It's so exciting. Everyone's getting fired up about Azure Stack HCI um, within Dell and um, want, uh, really wanting to be able to support our customers more on their Microsoft journey. So, and then what's even more encouraging is that people are looking to learn more about Microsoft uh, technology so they can have that conversation. So I'm like this, every email, what training can I do? I'm like, the AZ, AZ 900. And then I'm like, check out this series from Dwayne on Cloud Lunch and Learn. <laughs> and then I'm like, here's Microsoft Learn. And people have been coming back and people are passing. And I'm like, at some point, someone's going to say to me, so Lisa, do you have the AZ 900? And I'm like, I'm going to need to, I'm going to, need to get it. So yeah, I think um, I'll do that. Then I think I'd quite like to do the Power Platform foundation one and then I might just see if I can do the foundation I won't set a time limit on time frame on it but the the foundation exams for each of the topics I think that would be yep. quite useful um within sort of my role and the discussions that I have um mm -hmm. but we'll we'll see I am not putting too much pressure on myself because um I'm bad for that <laughs> <laughs> um so then talk to us about how you got into your now dream job of teaching, because that's an interesting story in terms of how social media played a part and um, how that happened through 2020, which was an interesting year for everyone. And also um, how and if that was linked to you um, getting your MVP as well. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I was in kind of a transition period a couple of years ago where uh, where the company I was with was was making some adjustments to their marketing department and a product management fell under that. And there were certain, certain just aspects of it that made me uncomfortable. <laughs> so, uh, so as, as I was getting more, getting more certifications, I um, also got my, Microsoft certified trainer at the time. And, and one of the things that, one of the trainings that I was using to get certified was, uh, was Skylines Academy, uh, Nick Collier, uh, and really enjoyed his trainings. And yeah, I reached out to them uh, at the time and we just kind of struck up, struck up a friendship, uh, kind of just kind of good business, you know, just a business, a business friendship, and they were looking to expand and uh, and asked me if I was interested in doing some content for them. And I started the AZ 500 class with them and worked with Nick on that. Yeah. Um, and from, from there, I, you know, started, that's where I started really getting into social media. I, um, I decided, you know, and was started following like Richard Hooper and, yeah. and uh, Gregor yes. Sudi and working you know, and just shout out to Richard and meeting. Gregor huh? shout out to Richard and Gregor yes. honestly those two are a powerhouse they are the social media they are the cloud family powerhouse definitely yes. <laughs> hashtag cloud family if you want to basically and get involved with any of us or see what's going on in the cloud family world um Richard and Gregor are yeah absolutely brilliant um, follow them if you don't already. I'll actually put their tags in the in the comment. For yeah, this definitely. Well. They, those um, those guys are great. They're welcoming. Yeah. You know, if you're new to the community, they welcome you with open arms, and that's yeah. really where my social media life kind of started. I wasn't really active on Twitter. I was active on LinkedIn, but yeah. But those guys brought uh, yeah. Those guys welcomed me to the welcomed me to the. Uh, to the UK, essentially. <laughs> yes, they're honestly they're they're just they're absolutely brilliant. And if you want to be part of the community and you're not sure you've got you you're not sure sort of who to follow or you know you've got a specific interest, they can just point you to where to go. <laughs> yeah, they'll just <laughs> like, help you out. They're next they're you the with best. the with the right people. So actually, Dwayne, we also need to talk about how you came up with cap. Well, 
how Captain Hyperscaler came about as well. So, <laughs> yeah, I was, you know, at probably it was probably around the fall of 2019. I was trying to, I was working to just get a a blog site started, and mm -hmm. I was, uh, I was going through, you know, I was getting it getting it going. I had just created a uh, a URL with utilizing my Dwayne and cloud, uh, Twitter handle, but just didn't, didn't pop so much. So, uh, and I happened to be in a, uh, selling, uh, a selling seminar for the week. And I was around all of my company's salespeople and, mm -hmm. and one of the salespeople came up, he was fairly new and just goes, Hey, it's captain hyperscaler. <laughs> <laughs> because that's that should funny. be that's what, we're, what i'm gonna call you captain hyperscale i'm like i i like that that's got a nice ring to it yes. I'm, I'm gonna I'm, I'm about to start a, a blog site and i'm gonna use that yes so, i can i can so that's work really that. that's really where it, that's really where it came from somebody uh, uh bill huckman if you're listening thank you very much for uh <laughs> for coining that phrase and allowing me to use it in social media so so that's where that's where it came about and you know it it worked out it stuck i you know got a little logo made and yep. all of that and uh and now i have it trademarked so <laughs> oh amazing amazing and at the time because i you know i wanted to get you know as as i was evolving in so in social media and in training you know i was not just doing stuff for skylines i was doing stuff now for obstility who i eventually went to work for um i was thinking about what whether i might do this full time and maybe do it as a you know as a freelance or mm -hmm. uh, or something different so mm -hmm. uh so i kind of used that captain hyperscaler as my brand and possibly what i was going to utilize as as a company name as well yeah um didn't have to do that because i got hired full time with uh obstility so so it all kind of evolved from there and that's where i am where i am today you know, I continued to just increase my amount of activity um, and getting involved in community events and in, uh, in uh, different training and all of those, th you know, and uh, and commu you know, community events, user groups, uh, conferences, things of that nature. And we uh, then, um, you know, that just evolved and I just did more and more and led for me being, you know, nominated for MVP and getting my MVP last September. So amazing. You know, that whole <laughs> that whole evolution, you know, and and like I said, you know, shout out to Gregor and and Richard because the first community event I did was their uh their uh their calendar, their advent their uh, advent yes, calendar the, the in 2019. So yes, the Azure Advent calendar. And then they basically leveled it up this year with the festive tech calendar, which yeah, was a was, monster yes. event, which was amazing. <laughs> I don't know how they had time to do that in their day jobs. <laughs> They're like I say, absolute powerhouses. Uh, I, I ran Azure, I did Azure back to school in September, and that was chat that was just getting people coordinated for one event, one one type of topic a day to get that online. Like you know, what they cats. did, what they did with all the animation and everything and three yeah. events a day and all of that. Wow. <laughs> sure of live recorded like community events. Oh Honestly, yeah. Right. I'm, I'm already looking forward to it next Christmas. In fact, you know, what I've learned this year is see the events that are coming up. I am blocking out time in my work calendar. Do you know what really upset me last year was when all this great community stuff was going on and I'm like knee deep in work and I couldn't like, I was like, no, I want to watch it at the same time everyone else is this year, making sure I carve out time to actually watch and uh, watch live. Um, right. Yes. So uh, nominated for MVP and then got it in September. So uh, actually, when we first met, I assumed that you were an MVP. <laughs> I had just assumed that you were. Um, I, th I think that you. happens with a lot of the people that are involved in the community. Yeah. So, you know, just yeah. because just because everybody is so involved, you know, and it's not like there's an ego about it no. either. You no. know, uh, you know, there were certain people that I was talking to and communicating with that I thought they were already MVPs when they got their MVP, you know? Yep. <laughs> so 
yeah i know exactly what you're saying <laughs> yeah i definitely thought um you were i thought hugo was when when we when we met um but it just goes to show that everyone is it's just such a great community and everyone is so um engaging um yes. so so actually we didn't i think did we mention the little fruit analogy that we came up with i mentioned the fruit analogy a little bit but not a whole and we didn't go into it a whole lot yes <laughs> To be fair, we're totally we're totally bigging this up. There really isn't that much to say, but we uh, we stumbled across across this on our, just our our prep chat and also just the chats that we have anyway. Um, we were talking about we were talking about comparing either major platforms like Azure, AWS, and Google or GCP, um, and how basically sometimes it gets quite frustrating when people try to compare either of those or maybe they're from more from my perspective they're hybrid um sort of offerings and the, right. we were discussing and I was like at the end of the day they're all platforms so they're all you could call them all fruit but they're really different right. um it's not like comparing apples for apples it's like comparing an apple with a banana with an orange so I mean you yep. bite into each one of them and it's a very different experience very different experience a very, very different, different experience Exactly, different, different experience from like the feel, the textures, the taste. Like it is a whole different world. Um, eating those just three, even even the approach in some places as well mm -hmm. in some ways. You know, exactly, like banana, the direction that they go. It. Orange, you've got to peel it. Apple, you could or you couldn't. Do you eat the core? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> there's just like they are very different, and I would. 110% say that that analogy, just bigging myself up here, but um, is a good analogy for describing the likes of Azure and AWS and Google because they all have extremely different backgrounds, extremely different cultures, extremely different approaches to their business, extremely different ways of how they develop products, mm -hmm. um, their product roadmaps, etc. cetera. Um, and it, it stresses me out a little bit that people don't get that yeah they just think that the cloud the public cloud is the public cloud and it's really not it's which direction you know you got you need to understand how you're going to structure that public cloud and what you're putting into that public cloud before mm. you really pick which provider mm. you know they and they all they, have their they different aren't strengths. they aren't all everything to everybody you yes. know i'm i'm partial to microsoft uh but but there are potential benefits to using AWS here or Google here as well. You know, mm. and that's why we have now the multi-cloud oh. terminology as well, which is hard hard enough to explain to people what's the difference between multi-cloud versus hybrid cloud. So yeah. So just hybrid, another fruit to, hybrid just another fruit to discuss. <laughs> so or actually multi-cloud is like the fruit bowl. Wow. That's yeah, it is. Very nice. There you go. It's the fruit bowl. It's <laughs> just it's um it's so true though. So hybrid cloud to me is um you've got stuff that you have on prem in a private or public, but we're not going to use that, you know, a multi-tenant potentially environment on prem. And then you've got something up in a in a public cloud. And that yep. could be any of them. Multi-cloud for me is when you're I mean, in my head, it's when you're using uh multiple of those platform public clouds. Yeah. So yeah, it's a bubble. subset. It's a subset of a hybrid cloud using multiple public clouds is really probably the easiest way to yes to explain it to people. I think yes. when when the term multi cloud first started coming out, people started thinking that it was the new term for hybrid cloud, and it's really not. Mm -mm. And that's the thing. Like people started thinking that it was a expansion of hybrid cloud, and yeah. it's kind of, it's, but it's more of a subset. Kind yeah. Of conversation like i said it's yeah. it is you're utilizing hybrid cloud but you're utilizing multiple cloud providers instead of just one to one yeah Probably and whilst the best, there is most, the best the best and most accurate way to explain it <laughs> at that point yeah. but but i've you know there's so many different perceptions of it out there it's become kind of a one of those one of those watered down terms out there that uh that i kind of you know get that starts getting under my skin after a while. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm so there with you, Dwayne. Do you know what I think is just so important is that under like cloud became a, an umbrella term for for 
freaking everything. Mm-hmm. Um, they all seem to go through the same journey. So I think it's just really important that when you're having a discussion with someone else or a customer, most importantly, um, or you're trying to share a message that you you kind of spend that time to define what you mean, or you ask the other person to define what that means to them. Like, what does hybrid cloud mean to you? What does multi-cloud mean to you? When you say yep. you have a cloud first strategy, what does that mean? Because mm-hmm. you can no longer just use these terms and expect to both be on the same page. Like you just can't. Um, and the other thing with multi-cloud as well, you'll see a lot of messaging right now that multi-cloud is the future. It's the only way to go for every customer. It's like, no. Multi-cloud is, there are reasons for it. Absolutely. I think, again, that's a subset of customers that would be able to use multi-cloud and, and do it well. I think you need to be super mature on your cloud journey. If you're wanting to just move around um, compute and IaaS, no, you're in a cloud point 1.0 mindset. You've, you've not yeah. caught up. So please come back to us where you're on cloud point 2.0 mindset. Um, but if you, you know, you know, you, you, you've see you've invested in AWS or Azure, but GCP are, you know, they're quite good at coming up with these new and innovative things. And you have a use for that specific thing at the time, then yeah, great, great thing of great, uh, use case for multi-cloud. But yeah, so yep, yep. Th- basically I say to people when they're like, so um, how do you compare um, Google Anthos, uh, AWS Outpost and Azure Stack? Like, are they the same? I'm like, no. <laughs> they are literally an apple, banana and an orange. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so there, there's some wisdom for you today, people. Um, <laughs> and I suppose before we finish off, we should give a shout out to Cloud Lunch and Learn. Yes. Um, Cloud Lunch and Learn is how we met, or did we meet on Global Virtual Azure? No, uh, well, probably a little bit of both. I, yeah, I think we did meet on Cloud Virtual, uh, Global Virtual, because because uh, you were, yeah, because I, th- I don't th- I don't know if we necessarily met directly, yes. but I think you you we were- mon- you moderated my session that we did uh, live on that Saturday. So yes, we were involved in it together, but I don't think we personally met. Hi, Lisa. I'm Dwayne until yeah. until Cloud Lunch and Learn started up. Yeah, yep. Yep. because and we did the first we did the first sessions for Hugo on Cloud Lunch and Learn when he got it started. On the we? On, we were not the first, were we? Yeah, we. Yeah, I think I was the first the first session on Azure on AZ two hundred four. I think Hugo had me as the first, if I recall. I don't know if he had anybody before me. I don't know, but <laughs> we'll just we'll just leave it at that. We we were yeah. the first. Um, yeah, because I met I met Hugo on uh, Global Virtual Azure, right. and that's where um, I met Hugo as well. Was through, yes. through doing that, and he, yes. he he had he had approached me because he was talking about starting Cloud Lunch and Learn, and asked me if I was interested in contributing, and I said sure. So I think that's why we put together the first. I think that was the first series that we did. So yeah. Um, so yeah, if you haven't heard already um, about Cloud Lunch and Learn, then please do check us out on Twitter at Cloud Lunch Learn. Um, also, please check out our YouTube video. Um, so Cloud Lunch and Learn basically started off as an initiative to um, provide people with uh, free learning opportunities within their lunch hour. Um, it was kind of around the UK EMEA time for lunch. <laughs> um, and we... I think we did over like 50 sessions last year. Um, yeah. You can catch them all on our YouTube. So um, like Dwayne said, if you're looking at that certification certification, or you've done a series on AZ900, we've got CDs on IoT, um, Power Platform, DevOps. Is there, is there a Kubernetes series Kubernetes, as well? yep. I uh, did a Azure Architect series. So I've done like three different series around around certifications and yep. objectives around certifications so yep and they're all on our youtube um we also ran our first ever ideathon which is an event aimed at bringing together both technical and non-technical people to solve real world uh, life problems um and that was really cool last year and we'll be doing more of them this this year and um, our sessions will be kicking off with um this week actually so it might have kicked off prior to me getting out this video um but it's kicking off this this friday so friday no thursday the fourth um a new iot series three sessions in that actually leading up to a iot workshop that's being held by the microsoft dev 
Ireland team um, in March. So yeah, kicking off with IoT and then we've got loads of more sessions lined up. And me and me and Dwayne are now team organize CLL sessions. Yes. Yes. Exciting. So, <laughs> if you... And lots of sessions to organize. It's very, yeah. Lots which, of people want to contribute, which is great. Yes, we are great super... to have too many. Great to have too many and push them off a month or two rather than fighting to find sessions to keep, yes. the, keep the cloud lunch and learn alive. Yes. <laughs> So yeah, we are definitely we, alive and well, live and well in 2021. Yes, absolutely is. Um, and we're going to try out something a bit different. So we're actually going to um, do the sessions at 6 p.m. GMT um, on Thursday or Wednesdays. Um, and we're also going to do them live. So we're going to try that out. It's lunch somewhere around the world and we want to be as inclusive as possible. Um, so we're going to try that out for our, our, our next little uh bunch of sessions and see how that goes but yeah if you haven't checked us out already please do um yes. and if you'd like to contribute please hit us up um anything else to say Dwayne? <laughs> i think we've covered it all here in i the think last we hour. have covered it all um <laughs> your amazing story on how you got into tech career development social media mvps a rant on hybrid cloud terminology this is exactly what i like out of an episode <laughs> And my door's just gone. <laughs> <laughs> so with that said, thanks so much for joining me, Dwayne. And thank you very much for I'll having me. I'll speak to Lisa. you soon. <laughs> yes, great. Bye. Have a great day. Bye.